following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. I wanted to spend some time today talking about how we view the world and other people and how this relates to our spiritual practice. Because the way that we are perceiving the world uh, affects how our, how, how our mind works and, and what we're experiencing in our internal world. Now, mental and physical oppression are very prevalent in the world today. There are many people in the world seeking to dominate the minds and the bodies of other people, to make them behave a certain way, or to think in a certain way, or do certain things, to subject others to their will in, in mentally, physically, or even emotionally. And every single person doing this, every, every one of us thinks that we are right, that we are justified in, in this behavior. They've, they've, they've studied this extensively, and they found that very, very few people actually believe that they are evil, even if they are doing evil things. That, that people, people generally think that they're behaving in the, in the best interests of, of, uh, of humanity. And, and, but it's, they say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And it's objectively clear from anyone who, can, who looks at the world that many people are not behaving in the best interests of humanity. Many people are not doing good. And so it's important to objectively look at ourselves and see how we are engaging in the, types of, uh, in the types of behaviors that could be hurting other people and in turn hurting ourselves. Now, even among Gnostics, there's, there can be a tendency to, to judge or, or condemn other people. And this can cause negative karmic consequences, both for ourselves and for others. And this disrupts our mental equilibrium, our equanimity, because this, this process of condemnation it interrupts the flow of our compassion and, and causes us to have a mental dis disequilibrium. And even if we don't condemn other people, there is a tendency to seek to dominate their minds, to imprint them with our ideas, to convince them that we are right, to infect them with our own egotistical viewpoints in tendencies. Have you ever noticed this? Just think into your life, like how the, how the ego has this desire to expand itself, not just within us, but also to spread its infection into others. That we like to see our own egotistical behaviors imprinted on other people, whether these be our friends, our children, our co-workers, that we like to imprint onto them our own types of behaviors. 
And in doing so, we are seeking to spread our own infection, our own ego. Karmically, this is very dangerous. Jesus said in the Gospels, but whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged around his neck and that he would drown him into the depths of the sea. That we don't want to infect those who are innocent, who do not yet have this particular ego with our own. Because then we're just creating more karmic consequences for ourselves. And this can even happen with gnosis. There can be a tendency to try to go around and, and convince people of the, the truth or the validity of the teachings. And Samuel reported getting letters asking him to do just that. Did I put this quote up here? Yeah. From time to time, disciples send us letters demanding that we dominate the mind of this or that woman for them. Alleging that they just want to bring these women to the right path. This is how their lust is hidden within the incense of prayer. By demanding enticement, by demanding of us works of black magic. This is how they tempt the elder brothers. No one has the right to violate the neighbor's mind because this is a crime. The neighbor's freedom must be respected. And so even when people are coming to Samuel and are asking him to, to go around and convince other people of, of, of the, the, the truth of Gnosis, to, to go and, and, and defeat their mind for them so that they will believe, he's saying this is black magic because it's imposing your viewpoints upon other people, thrusting them upon those who would not otherwise accept them. It can be very, very easy to mentally overcome a person if you are strong in that area, to, to, to beat back and, 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 and clobber any sort of mental resistance they may have to a particular idea. Just as someone who is physically very strong can, can, can overcome a person physically, someone who is mentally very strong can overcome a person mentally, but that doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. Because you're violating the freedom of the other person. And he called this an act of, of, of black magic, attempting to dominate the minds of others. Now, this is how Samuel and Vior perceived the attempt to dominate others' minds. But Gnostic students tend to have a very different attitudes than the masters when it comes to how we view others. And so, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at some of the masters in our tradition. And how they approach this topic of freedom of thought and word and deed. And I invite you, as you're listening to some of these, uh, uh, some of these teachings, to compare these attitudes of the masters to the way in which we all handle our own mind and our own relationships with other people. Now, before I, before I get into this, I don't, want to, I, I don't want to give people the impression that it's... it's it's wrong to share the teachings. They, we don't, we, uh, Jesus also said, do not, uh, who, who lights a lantern and puts it under a bushel basket? That's silly, right? So we don't, well, I don't want to tell you that it's wrong to share the teachings. But we don't want to impose the teachings upon those who do not want them. That's, that's what I'm trying to, uh, trying to get across here. And so... The first one is Samuel and Vior speaking in the Aquarian message. He says, you must be charitable. We sin against Christian charity when we criticize the religion of others. Cultivate respect and veneration. Respect your neighbor's beliefs. Respect the religion of your neighbor. And do not force anyone to think your way. Do not criticize. Remember that each head is a world. And do not sin anymore against the charity of Christ. Humanity is divided and subdivided into groups. And each group requires a special system of teaching. Each group needs its school, its religion, its sect. These are the commandments of the Blessed One. And we violate the law of the tranquil heart 
when we criticize others. So not everyone is going to follow our path. Some people vibrate better with other religions and practices. And Gnosis, sorry to say this, even though we're moving into our bigger space, Gnosis is never going to go mainstream. Um, not in this age. I mean, it, 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 I'd, love it, I, I'd love it if it would. Um, it's not something... Uh, uh, the, the fact that this is sort of a, 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 a small and a narrow path is not something that necessarily makes me happy, but it's, it's, it's true. That the message here that we are pushing is just not something that's going to vibrate with the majority of people on this planet in this age. Um, and even Samuel and Vior, he warned against like, just having curious people join the, uh, uh, join the, 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 the Gnostic movement because it's, it's, it can create... It can create difficulties for them. It can, it can uh, harm those who, who seek to do these practices, but not seriously. Okay. And for some people, what they need help with the most is just combating their own egos and suffering. They don't necessarily need to know about, about Atlantis or initiations or, or mountains or samadhis or astral projection. They just need to know how to live in the world. They need help smoothing the landscape of their own minds. And we can help with that. That our knowledge, our experience, navigating our own minds, seeing our own egos and coming into contact with true reality can help those who have not seen it. And we can help them without necessarily forcing the whole boatload of everything that we have onto them. And Samuel and Vior said, that, said in Hell, Devil, and Karma that every religion has an exoteric and an esoteric aspect, and different people will need different aspects of these religions depending on where they are in their own personal development. So we can use what we have learned in this tradition to help other people without necessarily thrusting them onto the road to Calvary. And to do that, we have to be able to meet them where they are. Not just physically. You don't necessarily have to be physically present with the person, though that can help. But mentally and emotionally, to try to understand another person without necessarily trying to change them. And be willing to work within their mental framework rather than trying to force them into our own. That's one of the beauties of this tradition. That we get exposure to so many different religions and practices and experience with so many different practices, different states of consciousness, that we can be very adaptable when it comes to helping others. That we can understand someone coming from a, a Buddhist perspective or a Christian perspective or a Jewish perspective, and we can operate within their framework and use the tools from their traditions to help them Get where they need to go. St. Paul said, I become all things to all men so that by all means some men might be saved. We have to meet them where they are. And the other aspect of this is we have to give people the freedom to come and go. Many people walk through our doors and then walk right back out again. And it's always hard when, when we see people leave. And there can be a tendency among groups to, to criticize or, or gossip. Like, this person's fallen off the path. Or, I'll pray for you, sinner. And, and it happens even when people go into different groups within Gnosis. The, 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 oh, this person joined a, a, another, another Gnostic group. God help them. I don't know what those people are doing over there, but it can't be any good. We're the only, we're the only ones doing the right thing here, right? Uh, 
Mahagosananda, the supreme patriarch of Cambodian Buddhism, um, he said that gata agata, coming and going without hindrance, is another name for Buddha. Gata agata, coming and going without hindrance. So we have to respect the inner Buddha. Of the people that we encounter in life and give them the freedom to come and go without hindrance. It's always more joyful when people come than when they go. But to truly respect people's freedom, we have to avoid condemning them, even in our minds when we see them go. Some people will walk through our doors and hear what they need to hear for their particular point in life. And that's all they need for that, for, to get through that part of their journey. And maybe someday they'll come back. Maybe they'll, maybe they'll return. We never know what's, what's really going on inside a person. We never know what a person truly needs to get through their, their stage of the path. And so we have to respect them wherever their path happens to lead them. So we have to allow them to be free, whether they come or whether they go. Free from criticism or gossip or, or slander or our attempts to dominate their minds to make them stay. Now, it's one thing to take a certain attitude towards how people think. But how do we respond to what they they do. Now, we've all been taught that, that slander and gossip and criticism are bad. Most of us learned this in, in, in childhood. Now, we still do these things in our hearts, but at least we know that it's wrong. Right? However, in polite society, we often try to hide these tendencies by disguising them as something else. Right? Because we, we know it's wrong, and we don't want people to know that we're, we're, we're criticizing other people, so we... we Try to do it discreetly, right? Like in, in, uh, in Christianity, I have a lot of uh, Christian friends. They often say, well, I'll pray for you so that you can become a better person, right? Or in Gnosis, we might say to someone, oh, you better work on that ego. That looks like something really bad you got going on there. You better, you better take care of that, right? Um, and these are just subtle ways in which we try to criticize others and assert our own superiority to other people. Is trying to call out their flaws for them, saying like, oh, I don't have that, but uh, I, I, I hope you were able to fix that so that maybe, maybe uh, you, you can be a better person. And uh, I'm, I'm just looking out for your best interest there. Now, now Samuel had this to say about, uh, about criticism, and I wanted to, to share this with you. It says, when one projects the light of the consciousness onto that unknown face of our psychological moon, one changes completely. When we discover that we are violent, then we learn how to tolerate the violence of others. And it becomes possible to say to ourselves, I am violent. So why am I criticizing that person? When we understand that in reality we are unjust with, with ourselves, then we learn to tolerate the injustice of others. We need to learn to receive with pleasure the unpleasant actions of our fellow men. But how is it possible to do so if we don't know our own unpleasant actions? For example, if we have anger and we know that it exists in us, if we have become conscious of it, it is obvious that we will excuse that defect in others. And as a result, there will be better relations with our fellow men. When we have envy and recognize that we have it, that it exists in the hidden face of our psychological moon, we learn to forgive the unpleasant manifestations of envy in others. If we are full of pride and we know that we have this defect, that we are vain and we recognize it, then we learn to see the vain person 
with more comprehension. We do not want to criticize because we know that within us, we have the same defects. If a man thinks that he is honest and is unable to lie, and suddenly somebody calls him a liar, obviously, if he has accepted that the liar exists in the dark part of his psychological moon, in an unconscious form, he will not feel offended, and he will know how to be more tolerant of his fellow man. It is very important to observe the hidden side, the side in which the critic, the censor, exists. Let us be sincere. Let us self-explore. Let us illuminate that hidden side of our psyche, and we will see that the defects we criticize in others also exist in ourselves. The censor and critic exist because of a lack of comprehension. What do we censure others for? What do we criticize others for? Our own defects. That is what we are criticizing. It is sad to know that we project our psychological defects onto others. It is sad to know that we see others as we really are. This is something that we have to understand. We all have the tendency to believe that we are perfect. But we have never had the idea to observe the other side of the moon, our psychological moon that is never visible. The time has arrived to seriously self-explore ourselves, to illuminate the hidden side of ourself in order to truly know the invisible side. When we illuminate that side, we discover with horror the psychological defects that we normally would not accept, facts that we do not believe we have. It is sad to know that we project our psychological defects onto others. That we see others as we really are. Because when we're interacting with a person, we're often trying to get some gauge as to what they are thinking as we're interacting with them. What do they really mean when they said this? What's going on inside of them? We don't just interact with the, the raw physical sensations. We're trying to get some insight into a person's mind. But we've never seen another person's mind. What we have seen is our own mind. And so when we interpret other people... We're interpreting it through the lens of our own internal experiences. It is said that the things that we criticize the most in others are the things that we hate the most in ourselves. And we are completely unaware of many of the atrocities that we carry within. Samuel and Vior, I believe it was in the Three Mountains, said that he... Um, he thought he had eliminated the ego of, 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 of thievery. He said, even if there was a big pile of, uh, of gold in the streets, he said, I, wouldn't, I would not even take one coin out of that big pile of gold. Even if it was a big pile of gold dust, I would not even take one speck of dust off that pile of gold dust. There it is lying in the street. No one is guarding it. It doesn't seem to belong to anyone. It is not mine. I will not take anything from that. In the physical world, it's like that. But he said when he looked within, he saw that deep within his subconsciousness, there was still an ego of thievery. That if we sincerely look inside ourselves, we will see many things in our subconsciousness that we do not even imagine that we might have had. That we are not nearly as holy as we would like to believe. 
And many of the ways in which we act in the world, our behaviors, are simply the product of the way we have uh, developed our personality within this life. And if we happen to grow up in a different setting and develop a different type of personality, then behaviors that we're unable to manifest in this particular lifetime could come out. And we could become a completely different person than the person we are now because we carry those things within and they just might not be able to manifest outside. We have so many egos within that it's impossible to fully express everything that we have within our subconsciousness within a single lifetime. The personality just can't handle that. I said, if I, have a, if I had a thousand tongues and a pallet of steel, I still would not be able to enumerate all the different egos that I have within. And so we should be forgiving of the faults of other people and not condemn them or criticize them. Samuel says here in Fundamental Education, good and evil do not really exist since something is good when it, it is convenient and evil when it is not convenient. Thus, good and evil are a matter of egotistical conveniences and the capriciousness of the mind. The terms good and evil are always misused to justify or condemn our own errors. The one who justifies or condemns does not comprehend. Thus, it is intelligent to comprehend the development of evolving forces, but it is not intelligent to justify them with the term good. It is intelligent to comprehend the process of devolving forces, but it is stupid to condemn them with the term evil. Different types of energies that evolve, devolve, and that are in an incessant transformation exist within every human being. Therefore, to justify a specific type of energy and to condemn another is not to comprehend. Thus, what is vital is to comprehend. Among humanity, the experience of truth has been very rare due to the concrete facts that our minds are bottled up. Yes, people's minds are bottled up within the opposites of good and evil. The revolutionary psychology of all Gnostic movements is based on the study of the different types of energies that operate within the human organism and within nature. The Gnostic movement has a revolutionary ethics that has nothing to do with the morality of the reactionary ones nor does, does it have anything to do with the conservative and retarded terms good and evil. Evolving, devolving, and neutral forces exist within the psychophysiological laboratory of the human organism. These forces must be studied and profoundly comprehended. The term good hinders the comprehension of the evolving energies due to justification. The term evil hinders the comprehension of the devolving forces due to condemnation. Thus, to justify or condemn does not signify comprehension. Those who want to put an end to their defects must neither justify nor condemn them. It is essential to comprehend our errors. Nevertheless, teachers of schools, colleges, and universities advise their students to improve themselves as if the I could become better. They advise them to acquire specific virtues as if the I could attain virtues. It is essential to comprehend the, that the I can never improve. The I can never be more perfect. Consequently, the one who covets virtues strengthens their I. Good and evil do not really exist. Such terms are misused when we evasively seek to hinder the profound and detailed study of our own defects. So both justification and condemnation are unhealthy mental habits 
regardless of, when, of whether we apply them to ourselves or to others. And part of the reason they hinder our comprehension is that they prevent us from seeing the true nature of what we're actually observing. That these are just mental concepts of good and evil that we have been imprinted with. And if we try, if we say, oh, I'm not supposed to do that because it is evil, because it is bad, because it is morally wrong, this, this superficial type of, type of morality, then we will never really look into the deeper aspect of what's really going on with the energies in our mind, in our body, in nature. That what we want to see when we're comprehending is what are the actual effects of this action that we are undertaking. We want to be able to see the cause and the effect for what it is. Simply as it is, without projecting notions of positive or negative onto these effects. We want to perceive the truth. Just that. Just as it is. And what we'll often see is that Many of the things that we call evil are creating suffering for us. Are causing the devolutionary forces within our own bodies, within our lives, to accelerate. And we want to be able to perceive this without trying to project an artificial morality onto it. Now, other masters also share this sentiment. Where Samuel was talking about the lack of the existence of true good and evil. When Master M, in his writings, The Day Spring of Youth, and The Lord God of Truth Within, when he talks about evil, he often clarifies himself in order to avoid confusion. As we can see here. He said, we must remember that many people who are really great souls have fallen into ignorance, evil, through the practice of black, black magic. These people are halfway houses or contacting points with the dark realms of the so-called evil beneath our feet. And those who surrender their souls into these regions are able to pass the powers of darkness into humanity and contact with and contact people with the elemental and demoniac entities of nature and man. Now, should you meet these bringers of misfortune to others, be non-resistant and seek to speak of the good that you can perceive in them. So M here is treating even black magicians, and we like to demonize hypnosis. He's treating even black magicians with compassion. And he does not condemn them. He says, even great souls can fall into this trap. But he simply views their behavior as a manifestation of ignorance. They simply don't see what they are doing. They don't fully understand the consequences of their actions. And he looks for the good, even in those who would bring harm to others. Now this type of attitude is necessary in order to cultivate the true Mahayana aspiration. The desire to help all beings, all beings escape from suffering. Padmasambhava talks about this aspiration in the Tibetan Book of the Dead. 
He says, even though all phenomena are empty and selfless, sentient beings fail to realize this. Alas, how needing of compassion are they. So that all those who are the focus of our compassion may attain enlightenment, I must rouse my body, speech, and mind to the practice of virtue. For the benefit of all sentient beings of the six classes, from now until enlightenment is attained, not just for my own sake, but for the benefit of all, I must generate the mind aspiring to supreme enlightenment. How needing of compassion are those bereft of the teachings who have ensnared themselves within the unfathomable ocean of suffering so that all those who are the focus of our compassion may be established in happiness. I must generate the mind aspiring to supreme enlightenment. So Padmasambhava is emphasizing compassion for all sentient beings of the six classes. So we, we've talked about the six classes before. The, uh, the, the, the gods and, and the demigods and the humans and the animals and the, the, the hungry ghosts and the demons, right? So all the sentient beings of the six classes includes those in the hell realms. Now many of us are only willing to give compassion to those that we feel are worthy of deserving it. So I'm, I'm, here I am, I'm working to save everyone except the Republicans. <laughs> Or the Democrats, right? I want to save everyone except the 1% because they're stealing all the wealth, right? Um, or except the, the secret evil New World Order Illuminati Conspiracy Society. Those people, the, we, we, don't, we don't want those people. They, they, they can all burn, right? Um, everyone except the pedophiles. Everyone except the murderers, right? But, but, but all these people that, that we think are undeserving of our compassion. They are still incarnated here in the physical world, in human bodies. They are still at a higher level than those who are really deep in the hell realms. And yet Padmasambhava, he's saying we need to aspire to save even those who are Worse than the worst that we can imagine. And he doesn't condemn them. He doesn't say, oh, yeah, you deserve to be in hell. Good for you, good riddance. He views them as needing of compassion. That they lacked the knowledge of the teachings, and therefore committed actions that trapped them within this suffering, within this pain. He sees them not as being evil, but simply as being ignorant. They just made some bad decisions. And this could happen to any one of us. Like M spoke about in the, the, previous, the, the previous passage I read to you, any one of us could potentially have our minds trapped within a particular bottle and it just spirals out of control. Like M talks about here. That when you understand how terrible this situation is, you'll see why they need help. He said, if a man seeks knowledge and aspires for good, he will find himself upon his own level of aspiration and his associates will be similar to his own nature. Thus, men of knowledge associate together. And those in ignorance associate with those who do not have knowledge of good. In this way, Nature rewards and punishes mankind, for it is her intention to reveal to man his own true relative expression in nature. If man indulges his evil instincts, he gradually loses his freedom and comes under the jurisdiction of a dictator whom he must obey. 
Since happiness is the ultimate end of man's evolution, he eventually realizes that happiness can only come from freedom of individualized expression. The poor pygmy man standing alone in his ignorance of the law of karma. In the years between 1666 and 1766, the British alone imported into British, French, Spanish, and American settlements above three million slaves. A quarter of a million died on the voyage. Between 1766 and 1860, the total can hardly be credited. But by the law of cause and effect, the people who enslaved these Negroes must bear the penalty of being slaves to other minds. For nature is the law giver, and her penalties are according to the law. To profit by her teachings, a man must make alliance with nature and recognize her intelligent overlordship. In his ignorance, man knows not that nature is urging him and that myriads of eyes in nature are watching him. Like the ant, he is building his mounds in nature's thoroughfares where they are bound to be trampled down by the feet of time. Thus nature in her march is administering justice. Man is getting meted out to him the treatment which in present and past lives he is meted out to others. In similar manner, the God of justice is sifting the stars, enlightening some and clouding others. Thus, in, thus the spirit enlightens the minds of some while darkness clouds in on others, so that in them even greater ignorance of the law prevails. So I'm sure the men running these slave ships would not have enslaved others if, it, if they knew that it would make them slaves themselves. But they didn't understand the consequences of their own actions. And we all do things ignorant of the consequences that we would not do if we were better informed. And what is even worse is that those who do not know the law are pressured by karma into an even greater ignorance of the law, which leads in turn to even more violations of the law. And it's like a death cycle. And this is a severe and terrible situation to be in. And like I said before, any one of us could fall into that simply by making a mistake. Krishna describes a similar process in the Bhagavad Gita, where he says he casts the ignorant into the wombs of the ignorant, so that their ignorance increases. And Jesus said, several places actually, to those who have, more will be given, and to those who have not, even what little they have will be taken away. The flip side of this is if, if we act well, aspiring for truth, we will in turn be brought into the company of others who aspire for truth, and we will be brought into the contact of the teachings. Because seek and ye shall find, and knock, and shall it be opened unto you. And so just as evil actions can increase the propensity for evil actions, good actions can increase wisdom, which in turn leads to an increase in wisdom. To those who have, more will be given. And to those who have not, even what little they have will be taken away. But if you have not, then it becomes very difficult to claw your way out of that hole. So have compassion. Now, talking about compassion and talking about um, not judging others, I do not want to give you the impression that having compassion means cooperating with evil. That tolerance 
is not the same as complacency. So we need to seek a balance. So I wanted to leave you with a quote by Samuel and Vior that sums up the appropriate attitude for how we can deal with evil in the world. Because the world is full of evil. And so we don't want to be complicit with the evil. We don't want to help the evil. But we also don't want to interrupt our mental equanimity. Cause disharmony in our, in our own minds by, by judging and condemning it. So Samuel says in Revolutionary Psychology, it is possible that we may have, we may have hurt someone with a laugh or that we caused someone to fall ill with a smile or with a look that was out of place. Let us remember that in pure esotericism, good is all that is in its place and bad is all that is out of its place. For instance, water is good in its place, but if the water is out of place, it floods the house and then it causes damage. It would be bad and harmful. Likewise, fire in the kitchen, when it is in its place, besides being useful, is good. Yet the fire out of its place, burning the furniture in the living room, would be bad and harmful. Thus, any virtue, no matter how holy it might be, is good in its place, yet it is bad and harmful out of its place. We can harm others with our virtues. Therefore, it is indispensable to place virtues in their corresponding place. What would you say about a priest who preaches the word of God inside a brothel? What would you say about a meek and tolerant male who blesses a gang of assailants to rape his wife and daughters? What would you say about that type of tolerance taken to such an extreme? What would you say about the charitable attitude of a man who, instead of taking home food home, shares his money amongst beggars who have a vice? What would be your opinion of a helpful man who in a given moment lends a dagger to a murderer? Remember, dear reader, that crime also hides within the rhythm of poetry. There is much virtue in the perverse one and much evil in the virtuous one. And even though it may appear incredible, crime also hides within the very perfume of prayer. Crime disguises itself as a saint. It uses the best virtues. It presents itself as a martyr and even officiates in the sacred temples. So, if we are looking at our virtues as, as good or evil, then we're not seeing them for what they truly are. We need to see how everything operates within the circumstances in which it is set. We do not want to be complicit with evil. But we want to perceive reality as it is. That's part of what it means to awaken the consciousness. Do you have any questions? Great. Well, thank you all for go. Oh, okay. Hi. <laughs> Why is uh, the atom structured in a way that um, ignorant people are led into more and more ignorance and surrounded by ignorance as opposed to where ignorant people would be given the wisdom that it would take to pull them out of ignorance? Ultimately, that's what reality is trying to do. That. It's exactly, what, it's exactly what M was saying in, the, in that quote, that, that we attract to ourselves whatever we have within, that the exterior is a reflection of the interior. And so in order to help us learn about what we are, nature shows us what we are on the outside so that we can see it. And so by putting us, by showing us what ignorance is, we come to see this ignorance. And over time, over 
a great deal of suffering, we, see, we, we come ultimately to understand that this ignorance creates suffering. And so we're being shown what we are so that we can learn about ourselves. Yes, anything else? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. He does, he does say that. Um, and I'm not disagreeing with Krishna. What, <laughs> what, I, what, I, what I'm saying is that Samuel and Vyo warned against um, curious people entering, entering into these studies. And so that if, you, um, if, you're going to, if you're going to start on this path, you want to be, you want to be serious about it. Um, because if you... These same energies that work that were that we harness in, in Gnosis can also be uh, appropriated by the ego. And so if we're, if we're working to harness these energies and we're, we're not serious about these uh, uh, really awakening in the right way, what, we, what, what it can cause is a, a, a awakening within the ego, which um, is a, a difficult situation to be in. And so I'm not saying that you... you the, the practice is bad for you. I'm saying that if you're, if you're, you're going to do it half-assedly, um, may, maybe, it, maybe it's better to assess what, uh, uh, what, you're, what you're really after. Anything else? Yes. <laughs> Well, some of the viewers say that each avatar has a, sort of a, a dual role. That it, for, it, in, in one of these roles is to, is to help people get onto the, the direct path that, that leads to the absolute. And, and another one of these roles is to just help people out of their suffering, right? And so we can still, sort of like I was talking about at the very beginning of the lecture, we can, we can still help people who might not necessarily um, want to walk the path by just helping them to comprehend the nature of their own egos and their own suffering at a level that they can, uh, that they can understand and help them to recognize how these certain types of behaviors are creating suffering even, even in a, uh, uh, right here in this lifetime. Because the egos do create suffering even, or even in this lifetime. Karma can be, can be very quick. Right? And even just by awakening and changing our, um, this is getting a, a, a little esoteric here, but, but changing our, um, our mental vibration that we are, so that we are operating with at a, a, a higher level mentally, it's, it changes the, the psychological atmosphere around us even if we're not necessarily going out and, and, and talking to people. That there is, um, there's stuff happening on the mental plane that is causing certain waves of, of behavior and um, uh, obsession, uh, being obsessed with certain types of uh, phenomena that people are picking up from other levels of nature, the astral plane or, or, or the mental plane. And um, this, is, uh, this is a manifestation of the, the collective consciousness of humanity and the collective mental vibrations of humanity that are creating this type of environment. And so by changing our own mental environment and by ch uh, changing our own level of consciousness, we can just, by doing that, 
help to influence in a subtle way the, uh, the mental environment around us. And so that's another way in which we can manifest this compassion. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yes. What is our role? Because you kind of made a statement like, "Well, I'm going to pray for you" or something like that. So yeah. What would be the true? You can still pray for that person. That could be a good thing. Yeah. You're sending positive vibrations. But okay. Um, uh, uh, what would be other general types of things? It depends. It depends on the person. Um, if my particular way of doing things, I. Um, I'm cautious about being very direct because when you're very confrontational with people, what, what often happens is they put up defenses and they try to justify themselves. And so I try to do it more like uh, sandpaper. Or you, you, you like make subtle observations to a person and sometimes they can, they can pick things, these things up. Like if you have the opportunity to work on someone over time, you can talk to them in, in subtle ways that don't necessarily make them defensive. To try to hint to them and just sort of like, like make observations like, oh, you know, this, this, this doesn't, didn't seem to, to work out as, as, as well as maybe, maybe if we, if we anticipated, right? Or, you know, um, maybe this was caused by this. You know, if, if, you know, you know or, or, you know, you do things this way. You know, I've, I've found that this, uh, doing it this other way often works pretty well for me. Um, and uh, uh, it, it produced some good consequences for me. Maybe, maybe you want to try something like that too and see how you like it, right? Um, so, but if, uh, if it's a person that you, can be, uh, that you can be confrontational with and is sufficiently mature enough to not get uh, defensive or try to justify themselves, then you don't necessarily have to try to beat around the bush. Um, but uh, it, depends, it depends on your relationship with that person. It depends on the mind of that person. You also have to um, be cognizant of their own, their own mental environment um, and the, way the, the landscape of their own mind. And be aware that sometimes people's minds are open and sometimes they are closed. So that I have said the same thing to a person on different occasions. And on one time, it has a profound effect on them, and another time, it just falls flat. And you, so you have to be willing to work with a person over um, an extended period of time, if that's possible, to be able to get them when their minds are open. And be able to suggest to them ways in which they might be able to, to help themselves. And even just sort of uh, talking to them about um, uh, easily digestible aspects of the wisdom and helping them to see the nature of their own experiences can help because that brings some, sort, some level of comprehension for them and that's what we're seeing to, seeking to foster. I think you can, yeah. That is good too, yeah. That is good too, yeah. If you see someone as not being healthy, you still care about them. Of course. That's the lecture. <laughs> yes. I just want to say in defense of the curious, Jack, I believe you're a little bit curious to get involved. Yes, yeah, you do, yeah. Sure. Oh, okay. Yeah. But so, what ha how does that happen for those people who have no positive influences in their life and they're just surrounded by negativity? Mm -hmm. You know, when do they get a chance? Like, is it is the, does the being provide like you know random acts of mercy throughout their countless lives where they'll meet like a teacher and then the light will shine and then. Where's the mercy as far as 
suffering being increased dramatically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That can be a difficult hole to climb out of. Um, uh, the, sometimes the mercy is hell. Um, it's uh, whether, like, how the being chooses to organize a person's karma is up to that person's individual being. Um, and so sometimes the being will arrange a person's karma in such a way as to, is to, to, to give them an experience of the light. Most of us here, that's, that's why we're here. That we were trapped in ignorance and we came into contact with this light. But it, it, that requires good karma in order, to, uh, in order to be able to come in contact with that type of experience. You need to have something to work with. And whether the being chooses, uh, uh, an individual person's being chooses to, to, to do that for a person, it's, it's, it's up to them. Uh, and the will of the being. So can the will of the being override karma? Nothing can override karma. So there's no but the being can organize the karma. In order to get, because the soul yeah. wants to return. So you have, you, have a, you have a lot of debts, right? Um, but the being can choose which ones to pay off first. It can give you a, 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 a repayment structure. <laughs> Anything else? Hi. Yes, um... I'm not saying we can't share with others. I'm saying we shouldn't try to, um, we shouldn't try to overcome their mind. Sort of like I, um, I, could, uh, I could say to someone, hey, do you want to go for a walk with me? That's not manipulating them. But if I tie them up in a sack <laughs> and I put them over my shoulder, that, that, that's, that's uh, not, not a good thing, right? I could even hold someone's hand while we're, while we're walking. And uh, maybe even try to, to direct the, the course, but I'm not, I'm not thrusting them into a particular thing. They they, all, they can always let go of my hand. It's like a very fine line. It is a fine line. There's a lot. There's there's a lot of fine lines to walk here, and this was what we're, we're getting at the at, at the end here. It's it's um, there's there is there is there is a line to there, there is a line to walk in uh, between the, like, tolerance and and, and complacency. And um, this whole path is a bit of a fine line, and that's why it's called the path of the razor's edge. <laughs> yes? Kind of going off the sheep a little bit, but I have a feeling those things. Doesn't this kind of imply that we know something that that person doesn't know? Like, oh, I see this in you. I'm going to kind of help you out with this. Doesn't that kind of imply that we have a superior kind of level of understanding of this person? And isn't it most of the time that we don't actually know what this person needs? Maybe we don't. And uh, probably, so you have to, you have to, it's, it's, um, wisdom and compassion have to go together. And so when you start to awaken your consciousness, some things become obvious, right? I know there's a chair in front of me, right? If you can't see the chair and you're blind, maybe I could get that chair out of the way for you. And so if, some, if, if, if the answer is clear, then it's, it's, it's obvious what you have to do. And that's not, you don't have to associate that with a sense of superiority. You don't have to associate that with saying, I'm necessarily better than you because I know this. It could be that in just in this particular area, I have some expertise that you don't have. Right? And so it's not wrong for me to say that I understand, uh, I have a better understanding of economics than the majority of people um, in this room, right? That's not necessarily a good or a bad thing, it's just what it is, because I've spent 11 years <laughs> studying economics, right? It's, uh, <laughs> and so that's not, that's not something I say to, to, be, to be superior, it's just like I, I happen to have knowledge in that particular area, but if, 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 uh, when it comes to uh, like real estate, if you ask me about, about real estate, this person in front of me, he would know a lot more about that than me. And that's not necessarily good or bad, it's just that we happen to have expertises in different areas.
So it's just being able to use the tools and the skills that you have for the, the, uh, the areas in which they are useful. But don't try to put a screw in with a hammer. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you, can, you can be have the, the data that yes, I, I have more impact than people, but maybe there's something else to be proud about. That. Yes. It, when when Jesus, Jesus said, when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And so do not let the ego appropriate the left hand, appropriate what the uh, the, the good the, the good works that, that that the consciousness is is enacting for you. Well, then, then that's, that's, that's something you, you should uh, pay attention to. That's a, yeah. Yes? The concept of free will. The concept of free will. Yeah. Where does that come to play you know, in terms of good and evil? Okay, I'm not sure. Uh, most of us have very little free will. And so we're sort of um, we're sort of impelled by the uh, by the conditioning that we have. Samuel Lanvior said that the um, the amount of free will that we have, if you can imagine a violin sitting in a violin case, the violin is very um, is very tight in the case, but there is still a little bit of wiggle room for the violin. So that is the amount of free will that we typically have. That we have 3% on average of our consciousness that is free. And the other 97% is bottled up within the ego, which means it is, is subject to the mechanical conditioning of our ego. And so there's very little free will to go on. But we have a little bit. And I would say the freedom that we have should be considered to be beyond the notions of good and evil. Because it just is. The consciousness is beyond good and evil. Don't create good and evil. You have the right to choose that, but who is choosing? That's what I'm getting at. Who is the one that is making the choice? Who is you? <laughs> I'm saying that within us we have many different conflicting desires and, and senses of self. So that the idea of a unified self a unified, uh, uh, a unified uh, desire is, um, it's a myth. It's, a, it's an illusion created by the physical body. That we have many different forces passing through our physical body. Think of like a, like a, a pipe, right? Think of the physical body as like a pipe. And there's water flowing through the pipe. Now it looks like if you looked at the water in the pipe, it looked like there's a, there's a solid single thing there as long as the pipe is full, right? Mm -hmm. But the individual water, like the individual molecules of water in that pipe are constantly changing. And that's what happens with our minds. That there are continually new forces and, and new desires and, and new selves that are passing into our minds all the time. And each one of these is, has uh, types of conditionings that are associated with it. Each one of those has the illusion of, of freedom and choice. But each one of those is in turn being driven by particular types of conditioning and particular types of desire that, are, that impinge, that, that restrict its exercise of truly free will. Because if we're constrained by our desires, if we're constrained by our fears, if we're being directed by these other 
forces be, uh, be, the, uh, besides our own freedom, then these things are constricting our free will so that we're not really free to choose. We're choosing accordance with our desires. And those desires are constricting us. That's what I mean by when I say that, that we don't have a lot of free will. The, the conditioning that we have, the way that we have been trained to behave is constraining our freedom. So that we don't have the true freedom that we should have. Part of what this, this, this teaching is, is to help us break free of that conditioning so that we can develop the true freedom of life free in its movement. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy.